Hello and welcome to Aspire Church Manchester. The message you're about to hear was recorded live at one of our recent services. If you stick around at the end, we'll give you more information about our ministry. But for now, enjoy the preaching. Because I told you that I have a real, uh, I don't want to say hatred, but I just don't like being religious. Sometimes when I see religion, I go, why? Why? I get about being holy and contrite, and I do know about being reserved as a good thing sometimes. I do understand that. But I also know that God's word is alive. It's quick and powerful, the Bible says. It cuts right to the heart. It teaches us things on how to live. It tells us about God. Because we don't know about God without the Bible. People who think about God in other ways apart from the word of God are just making it up. But we have the word of God. So today we want to get into this message. It's very simple. And it's not deep as I normally like to go on Sundays, but we're going to minister this message and call it the Yule Tide Cease Fire. Yule Tide Cease Fire. This is a combination of some things I read and heard a pastor preaching uh, years ago on this. I thought this is going to be the one for today. Yule or Yule Tide is an archaic term for Christmas. That's all it is. And uh, some now use it nowadays to kind of be trendy. You know, we're going to have the Christmas Yule log. You know, you're going to put it on the fire. It's the Yule log. And they're trying to be trendy using this old-fashioned term. I'm not trying to do that today. I'm using the term Yule Tide because what we're talking about today is not something that's common in the world in which we live. It's an uncommon thing. It should be common as Christians, but unfortunately, uh, it's not. And we'll, you'll see as we dig into this. The word ceasefire, I think we all kind of know what it means. Two warring parties that are firing at each other to make a decision. We're going to stop shooting. We're going to make some peace with our enemies, even if it's temporary. So you can kind of get where it's going just by the title, The Yuletide Cease Fire. So let's pray. Let's pray. Lord God, I pray today that your Holy Spirit would just enrapture hearts as well as dig deep into hearts. I pray, God, that you would strengthen people who feel weak and down and maybe sad. I pray you'd give them joy, God. I'm asking for families to be united. I'm praying for those who are in disarray and discord that you would begin to alter that. Give them steps so that this Christmas will be different than the last and a blessing for the future. I pray, Lord God, against the works of the devil that tries to lie and deceive, Lord God. This holiday is not about alcohol and food. This holiday is about the birth of your son, Jesus. We're thankful for that. We thank you for coming and giving your life for us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm going to put a picture of a guy up on the screen. His name is uh, Franz Ferdinand, and I must say his tash is just rocking. Can can all of you, you, even if you hate mustache, you got to say this guy has it going on. Can you say amen? (laughs) <laughs> and he, his name is Franz Ferdinand. He's an Austrian or was an Austrian archduke. And in the summer of 1914, he was assassinated, him and his wife, as they were driving. Uh, they both were assassinated. The country that he was serving, Austria, uh, uh, thought that a Serb had committed the assassination And so what they did is they declared war, Austria declared war on Serbia. And so uh, Russia, being an ally of Serbia, decided to declare war on Austria because they declared war on Serbia. And then Germany didn't like Russia, so Germany declared war on Russia. France got into the mix and declared war on Germany Britain finally said they've had enough and declared war on Germany, all because Franz Ferdinand, the Archduke, was assassinated. This led 
many of you might know this, to World War I. 20 million people died in World War I because one archduke was assassinated, they thought, by a Serbian, but it actually wasn't even a Serbian that did it. It took less than seven days for all of these countries to get into alignment and to declare war on each other. 20 million people died. I want you to take for a minute, just let that soak in. I want you to let that soak in for just a second here. One misplaced emotion. One misplaced emotion. Now, I'm sad for uh, the Ferdinand family, for sure. It's bad that someone was assassinated. But I want to tell you, if someone assassinates me, please don't start a war that 20 million people die. One misplaced emotion led to this catastrophe. And in World War I, once the battle started going, the main way that they had war in those days was what was known as trench warfare. Some of you have seen this on um, uh, uh, movies and the such where uh, they would be in one trench and then there's no man's land and then the trench of the enemy would be there and they would just hurl as much artillery as they could get going and they just kept doing this over and over and for six months the line never moved people just died it was just a horrific thing but then a surprise miracle took place At least I would call it a surprise miracle. Maybe a week before Christmas, possibly on Christmas Eve, no one really knows for sure, uh, but an unknown person, uh, all sides are claiming it was their man. No one really knows who the guy was, but all of a sudden on week before Christmas or on Christmas Eve, he gets up and he drops his weapon. He walks out into no man's land and says, let's have a ceasefire for Christmas went silent. Before you knew it, there was a Christmas truce, not an official one, unofficial one, between soldiers. The Brits getting up and playing football with the Germans. They're having these matches that were going on. They shared their rations. They helped each other bury the dead. They gave each other haircuts They did all kinds of things that you would not even think of. They gave each other souvenirs. And by all historical accounts, even after the ceasefire was over, the soldiers didn't want to fight anymore. They didn't want to launch any more weapons because now those people who were those men who were their enemies had now become their friends. As a matter of fact, it led to a change in how armies did battle. There became rules now of, and you've heard this before, no fraternizing with the enemy. This was not allowed. If you did that, they would kick you out of the army. And so the reason was is because once they started fraternizing, they stopped fighting. They stopped fighting and they couldn't carry on. And the generals couldn't carry on their battles. And I want to tell you that in our age, we have similar kind of trench warfare going on. You can see it on the pages of social media. If you do any digging into social media, you'll know there are people that are on there just trolling people, causing trouble, spreading lies or or spreading truths and just battling back and forth. People become pretty vicious when they're behind a keyboard sometimes. So you see it there. You see it in the workplace and many different places where people offer up vicious vitriol to one another and cause all kinds of damage, trying to hurt the other person. These are real, but here's a really sad reality, and this is where I'm trying to go with this today, is that the most harmful examples of trench warfare are found in homes, are found in families, marriages, and friendships, where there was a problem, some sort of issue went on, some lie was told or some thought was voiced that shouldn't have been voiced before you know it there's a battle going on any of you got any battles going on in your family are some of you dreading your Christmas dinner because you know that they're going to show up 
This is what happens in the world in which we live in. And the big question is, is who would move off their position? Who would stand up and say, hey, let's have a ceasefire. Let's drop our arms and our weapons and say, no. It's hard to do because you're right. I know I'm right. It's hard to, hard to say no because I, no ceasefire. They need to call ceasefire. I'm not calling ceasefire because I'm right. I've got all my ducks in a row. Ever been there? It's what happens. So what, what, what's the issue? How do, how do we have these Christmas miracles take place? And I want it to be more than just a Christmas miracle, but let's just start here. You've got to start somewhere, don't you? So let's just start here. What's the first thing that happens? You know, someone has to take the first step. Let's just start there. In any problem, if you've got a fight with your boss, someone has to take the first step. You've got to fight with your kid. You know, a, a lot of times we think about husband and wife fighting. Man, I fought with my kids. My kids would fight with me once they became adults. You know, we, we'd argue and go back. And so maybe who's going to take the first step in that situation? Who's going to lay down their arms? sometimes it's hard because they're not wrong. I'm not wrong. There was a story about a couple who were involved in silent treatment. You know what silent treatment is? It's when you get into an argument and you don't say anything to the spouse because the first one who speaks loses. (laughs) Come on. You're all looking at me like there's no silent treatment here. Me and Gracie have done that to each other. How about us? I'll make the first step and tell you it was us. <laughs> there was a couple who were playing at the silent treatment, and it went on for days. And finally, they, one night, they went to bed. They still hadn't been talking for days. Uh, but the husband had an early morning flight that he needed to catch. And so uh, he didn't want to be the first one to break the silent treatment. So he, uh, as they went to bed, he puts a, a note on her nightstand right there says wake me up at 5 a.m. and so all of a sudden you know they go to bed and they are asleep and then he he wakes up and he looks at his watch and it's 8 30 and he's like what what's going on and he's rushing around and he's angry and all of a sudden he sees a paper on his nightstand that says wake up it's 5 a.m. Let me just say this about any kind of trench warfare in any relationship. If you're making a stand, if your stand that you're making hurts the one you love, it's not worth making. It's not worth making. I think of all the arguments I've had with the people I've loved through the years. None of them are worth it. I stood on principle. I still feel I'm right to this day. But I want to tell you, they're not worth it. So what do we have to do? We have to drop our weapons Drop our weapons. We have to have a a truce. We have to drop our weapons. Some will remember and familiar with, if you've been in this country for any length of time, you'll be familiar with something that we've called the Troubles here in Northern Ireland. And that was when the IRA was battling against uh, the government of Great Britain and there were terrorist campaigns launched by the IRA against Britain, the British Army, Uh, Those who sided with Britain uh, fought with those who were siding with the IRA, and it cost 30 years, 30 years of mayhem, mayhem, devastation. Uh, The streets were filled with violence here in Manchester. We suffered uh, some of that here, even while we lived here. And they tried and tried to have peace treaties. And there was one peace treaty after another. And they would try to come to the table and hash out an agreement. But there was always one sticking point. And the sticking point was, will you give up your arms? Who will decommission and turn in their weapons? Because to be honest, to say you want peace while you're still holding a weapon is not very peaceful. And that was a huge problem. And that spiritually, emotionally, however we want to phrase it, that same truth is true in our lives, in our home, in our family. We have weapons that we hold on to, things that we carry, that we bring to the table, that some of you are even prepping your weapon for tomorrow's Christmas meal. 
I'm shining up my gun here. You know, I'm, I'm sharpening the knife because I know she's coming. She got the best of me last year, but it ain't going to happen this year. I, I'm taking care of my weapon. We already got our thoughts going that way. And there's different relational weapons that we use in family sometimes. I told you this was going to be different. We're not talking about baby Jesus here, are we? (laughs) Our relational weapons can be sometimes our beliefs. Our beliefs. Everybody has a set of beliefs. We know that our beliefs in the Bible and the Word of God, those are solid. We have to stick by those. But we can even use that as a weapon. You know, I've got neighbors, they're unbelievers, and their sins are piled to the high. And uh, they, they, if I told you all the things that they did, you'd be shocked at how sinful they are uh, compared to other sinners in the world. But I want to tell you something. This doesn't stop us from going and befriending them and trying to love them and help them and encourage them as best we can. Because I could come and say, hey, what you're doing is wrong. The Bible says, and you can use your beliefs as a weapon. And it just doesn't even have to be biblical beliefs. It could be any kind of biblical beliefs where you're, or any kind of beliefs where you're taking a stand. <laughs> Sometimes we have to take stands. I get it. But if you have to take a stand and then aim your cannon at another person, something's kind of wrong with your stand. I think you need to reevaluate here, especially during this Christmas time. We all know another weapon that we use is our words, don't we? Our words can cut. I think that as I've gotten, uh, not just older, but as I've gotten off my teen years and my 20s, I started realizing how harsh words can be. When I was young and heard words, I didn't care much. But as I've gotten just a little bit older, I realized those words can actually hurt. And they can actually sting. And people use their weapons uh, to wound uh, and to kill. And some are really good at using their words. They know how, we used to have this phrase that we'd use in California and say, we cut you low, man. Just cut you low. And people know how to cut you low. Some of you teenagers, you're good at it. You know how to say the right things. You send the text at the right time. You make the social media post. You know, you, you, you do the TikTok video that just gets at them. You, you, you try something to get at that one that annoys you. We use our words, our beliefs, our words. But then there are also like nonverbal cues that we use. Eye contact, looks. I've never been good at it. I've always wanted to have. Have, have you ever heard people say they can use their, that evil eye? I, kids all say, call it an eagle eye, but it's not an eagle eye, it's an evil eye. They have that look, you know. And there was this little kid that uh, hung out with our daughter, and he would had this evil eye that he could give to my daughter. And I said, man, this guy's good. But I want to tell you, my daughter learned how to do that evil eye too. Sometimes she's still, even to this day, she's not 25 anymore, and she can give me the evil eye. Those nonverbal cues, it's the way you stand. It's the way you look. It's the things you do. It's you, you time it just perfectly as they walk in and you just turn away. You know how to do. You know how it goes. We, we can make a big old list of these things, can't we? Nonverbal cues. These are weapons. And I want to tell you that when personal battles continue on over time, people get hurt. And before you know it, It was just one assassination. And now you've got 20 million people laying dead because one misjudgment, one misplaced emotion, one refusal to lay down your arms. So what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? First of all, let me give you some stuff that everybody knows. Even people who are not saved will tell you these things. Not Christians, they'll tell you these things. First of all, focus on what unites. Focus on what unites. If you've got a problem, anybody, don't, don't raise your hand because they may be in here, but some <laughs> that you may be going to dinner with tomorrow, you know, if you're going to have them and you already know that what's going to come up. You know that it's going to just be that thing there, that, that tension in the room that uh, Pastor Allen always calls it the elephant in the room. Yeah? So we know that that 
can take place. You already know the differences that you have. Focus on what unites, on what brings people together. Even marriages sometimes this, you know, you would think that you've been married for so long that you would already just be unified, but, you know, after time, sometimes you don't, and sometimes you just have to lay down your arms and say, okay, what, do we, what can we agree on here? Let's, let's focus on that, at least for this temporary time. The Germans and the Australians and the British were able to get out in the middle of no man's land where they were once lobbing bombs and shooting uh, weapons, able to kick a football around because, hey, we all like football. They were able to share some food because, hey, you got to eat. Focus on what unites. Can you do that? Can you do that? Because sometimes when you're angry, it's hard to do that. Sometimes when you're upset, you're not worried about what unites you. You're worried about that thing that divides us. So, there's this something that's said by people who bring people together. They said there's more that unites us than divides us. I'd say this is probably generally true with many people. I've learned that in my witnessing and sharing Christ with people. I used to just immediately out the gate talk about sin and need to get right. And Jesus is the Savior. Bible's the truth, man. And just start off out the gate because I'm bold. I don't, I'm not afraid. I'll do it. But I learned that that wasn't very effective. And over time, I tried to find common ground. So, okay, we might not have a lot in common, but let's find some common ground here. What, what is it that we can talk about before we get to the gospel? And then after a while, be able to share the thing that can heal and can save and can deliver. It's not a trick way of doing things. It's not a trying to spin things. It's just focusing on what unites. We should do that amongst family, amongst brothers and sisters in Christ. I hate that churches are so divided. I get sometimes we can't help it that churches are sometimes divided over what they believe about the Bible and what can we do? The Bible is the Bible. We have to believe it or not, you know. But I do hate that those of us who believe primarily the same thing, sometimes there's this tension I think that sometimes we ought to reevaluate our position on there and focus on what unites. But I don't want to get off. I'm bringing this to this main point here this morning. What is it that we need to do? Focus on what unites, sure. But there's another thing that you have to consider. In the psychological world, people who are psychologists and try to counsel people through therapy and different things, they talk about something called conflict resolution. If Gracie and I have ever sat down with you and to help, tried to help you through in your marriage, you know that we've discussed conflict resolution. It's one of the things that you need to learn to do if you're going to have a successful marriage. It doesn't matter how much you love each other and how much you care about each other. There will be conflict and you need to learn to resolve that. However, The biblical approach that just focuses on how to bring warring parties together is not primarily focusing on conflict resolution. It's focused on a word called reconciliation. It's a little bit the same, but it's a little bit different. And I think it's important for you to recognize if you're not a Christian here today, and you need to know about reconciliation. Because when you were born into this world, at some point, very quickly, you started sinning. You started doing wrong things, whether it be in your mind or your heart. And eventually it plays out in actions. Maybe it's self-righteousness or pride. It might be something more corrupt like addiction or some other type of sexual sin or a, a, a verbal sin you use with your mouth, whatever the case may be, it's not hard to realize that you're a sinner, right? Everyone else may be doing it, but it still doesn't make it right. And so when God looks at that and says, hey, you're not doing it right, he doesn't come down and say, let's resolve our conflict, He doesn't say, hey, you're a sinner, so stop sinning here and come over to my side. 
lay down your, your sin and be religious with me and uh, we'll, 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 we'll work it out. He doesn't do that at all. Some people in religion, they're trying to make their way up to God, aren't they? I'll go to church and somehow I'll make enough signs uh, and I'll pay enough penance and I'll do enough things and then I'll, I'll, I'll be able to reach God. And it never works. It never happens that way. That's because that was never God's plan. God said, look it, your sins are so bad. We've got to not resolve this conflict. We need to reconcile it. And it's important that you catch that word. And let me share with you what the scripture talks about. Ephesians chapter 2. Can you just follow if I just read it for you? Ephesians 2, 13 through 16. Listen to this. But now, and he's talking to Christians here who are already Christians. He says, but you have now been united with Christ. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. That's true, right? Before you are a Christian and know God, you may want to know a little bit about God, but you're far from God. You don't care about God. You don't even think about God. You just live your life. You are far off. You knew you were a sinner. But Jesus' death on the cross is what brings us to him. Stick with me here. Verse 14, for Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. People are talking about Israel and Hamas. I want to tell you, you can try and resolve that conflict. It's not going to happen. But you know what could resolve it? Jesus. Jesus. Jews and Gentiles, non-Jews, brought together, it says, into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. There's a wall of hostility between the sinning non-believer who doesn't have faith in Christ. There's a wall of hostility, just like there's a wall of hostility in your family when you're in trench warfare. There's this wall of hostility in marriages uh, and with kids. Uh, some of you teenagers, you're so angry at your parents at the way they are. You think they're so strict. It's just bothering you. Some of you kids here today are so angry at your mom because of the, she didn't let you do something. And there's this wall of hostility that separates. And Jesus is the one that breaks down the wall of hostility that separates us. Verse 15, Ephesians 2.15. He did this by ending the system of law with commandments and regulations. Do this, do that, do that, don't do that, do this. It's okay to do that on, on this day, but not on that day. Hey, uh, kill a bull if you've done this. Uh, a couple turtle doves will do for that. Nah, none of that. All of that didn't work. It's not effective. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from two groups. Gracie and I were talking about when we first became Christians, one of the things that turned us on was not the preaching. It wasn't the singing. What turned us on was that there were people that were from gangs, that were from other gangs, that were normally, and you've heard of drive-by shootings in California and LA, Chicago, New York. These guys were shooting at each other, and now they're in church. One people lifting hands to the Lord, still dressed like gangsters. Jesus did that, took two groups and made one group. I want you to think right now of your, yes, 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 yes. Think about the person you hate the most. Oh, pastor, I'm a Christian. I don't hate anybody. Liar. <laughs> think of the one you hate the most. The one who was in this building today and you'd be like, oh, they're here. They're here. I don't know how we're going to get out of here. I can't take it. I want you to think about you and that person, two separate people being brought together as one. That's what Jesus does. That's what Jesus does. He takes those who are far from God 
and brings them into the group that is close to God. (laughs) Powerful, powerful. It says in verse 16, together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. And here's the last phrase of the verse that I really want you to catch. And our hostility towards each other was put to death. And our hostility towards each other was put to death. The one you're going to go to battle with tomorrow at Christmas dinner or tonight at Christmas Eve or when you go back to work and you see them in the lunchroom, he can bring us together. Hostility can be put to death through Jesus. Through Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 19 says, For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Listen to this. No longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave this wonderful message of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5, 19. We truly need to follow Christ's example of no longer counting people's sins against them against them man in the I, I, I'm like everybody else you know throughout my life people have sinned against me before I was a Christian I didn't know it was a sin against me but once I became a Christian I remember I was not saved like a year I told you already I was the only white guy in my church and so uh, I stood out like a sore thumb but uh, I was growing for the Lord I wanted to do some things for God and Gracie was excited too and she got on this women's committee and there was this other woman that didn't like that Gracie was on this women's committee and so her husband figured out how he was going to get Gracie off that committee he was going to go and challenge me to a fight in the parking lot in the car park You're saying, wow, what kind of church is that? It was a crazy church. That's what it was. Crazy church. Holy Ghost and exciting people getting saved right and left. Still a lot of carnality, though, a lot of hostility. And I remember when he comes and he goes, right now, me and you out there. And man, I was like, come on, let's go. That's what I'm thinking in my head. I go, nah, nah. How could I say nah? Because Jesus didn't count my sins against me. I'm not going to count this man's sins against him. What about your uncle, your annoying friend that you have, your coworker that's just driving you up a wall, your parent that you're just absolutely sick of? What do you do? Don't count their sins against them. You say, well, that's like super hard. Well, no kidding. It was super hard for Jesus. He had to give his whole life on the cross to not count our sins against him. (laughs) Jesus' death on the cross to reconcile people to God gives us the same power that we need to reconcile with people in our lives. You say, I've been trying to get on with my auntie for years, but she just is too stubborn. I want to say, take the first step. See what God can do for you. See what God can do for you. I understand. Listen, we're going to close. I understand that sometimes these things are very complex. (laughs) And I understand sometimes you need to have discussions. And I know sometimes it's hard and difficult. But look, it. after you've made the first step, after you've laid down your arms, after you've made a decision to reconcile, then there's time for discussion. There's people in my world that have sinned against me that I'll forgive them. But if we're going to ever have a relationship, we're going to have to talk about a few things. But I want to start in my own heart by laying down my hostility towards them. And not counting their sins against me as wrong. And I would hope that they wouldn't count my sins against them as wrong. We need a Yuletide ceasefire this Christmas. Can you say amen? Every suspension of hostilities starts somewhere. Luke 2.11 through 14 says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. A Savior. Doesn't that word just make you feel like 
Wow, a savior, someone who can save me, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Can you say amen? Let's give him praise today. Heavenly Father, we love you today. Let's praise him like he's in the room. Let's praise him like Jesus is walking. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Glory, 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 glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. We should always praise God more than we praise our football team. We should always praise God more than we praise whoever for the pay rise that we got. We should always be loud and boisterous more than we would be when we're angry and want to get on somebody's case. Let's praise God like that. Today, we're going to close. We're going to take communion. You know what communion is? It means that we're connecting with the one who saved us. If you're not a Christian, communion's not for you. If you want to become a Christian right now, you can become a Christian right now and take communion. You can do that. Communion is nothing special. It's just some fruit of the vine for us, grape juice, and a little bit of bread. It's usually just a little cracker. But it doesn't matter what the actual thing is. It matters what it represents. matters what it represents matters what it represents. And right now, what God wants from you is your heart. It's your heart. Are you a Christian here today? If you are, praise God. You're my brother. You're my sister. We're family. We may not look like each other. I know it's hard to get attached like this one. I, I recognize. Is it a little joke right there? But we're still family because of what Jesus did. If you're not a Christian, we're so glad you're here. And we want to tell you, we don't want you to to run off. Even if you're not ready to accept Christ, fair enough, that's your choice. But the Bible says at the end of time, we're all going to give account to God. And I wouldn't be doing you a, a service if I just let you off easy and said, no problem, go your way, do what you want. Mm -mm. No, our sins will get a hold of us and will take us to a place we don't want to go. And I don't want to spend time talking about that right now. But I do want to tell you, your sins can easily be forgiven by the one whom we're celebrating was born on this day. He wasn't just born, he also died. And when he died, his blood broke down the wall of hostility between you and God. His blood was sufficient to get you into heaven. Your good works, insufficient. All the things you try to do to be a good person, insufficient. Sufficient is Jesus and what he did. If you want him today, we want to pray with you. Why don't we bow our heads? Heavenly Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters here, but I also pray for those who are not yet brothers and sisters, that today they would become brothers and sisters. For those who are not yet Christians, Lord God, help them to open their hearts so that we can pray with them today. Lord, I pray that they would understand this is not about church. This is about you. This is about Jesus. This is about God. This is about the Holy Spirit. This is about real life. Lord, I pray for them. I pray for them. If you're here today, maybe you're not a Christian. We want to pray with you. Would you like to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior? You may say, man, I just came to church. It's Christmas. I just came to church on Christmas. I didn't come for all this. I get it. I remember when I had my first encounters with God, I was not ready for it at all. I was not prepared. I was not, I didn't have everything just the way I wanted. I wasn't even really wanting to do it, but I knew I had to do it. And maybe that's you today. Can we pray with you? If you need Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're not born again. If you were to die today, you'd be unsure if you would to go to heaven or hell. We can give you assurance because the Bible says it gives us assurance. And that's through Jesus. And we can just pray a simple prayer. It doesn't take long. 
It's not a big old long drawn out ceremony. It's a prayer. It's about you bringing your heart before God, the one that Jesus died for and can died for you so that you can have your sins forgiven. If that's you and you want that, why don't you raise your hand all across this hall today? Is there anybody today? I know it's hard when you feel like you're the only one, but I want to tell you, when you stand alone before God, it's going to be the only one. It's just going to be you without any help. So it's better to get over your embarrassment now than be embarrassed for all of eternity. If that's you, is need Jesus, raise your hand. Thank you for joining us today at Aspire Church. If the message today has blessed you or there's something we can help you with, we'd love to hear from you. Send us an email to info at aspirechurch.co.uk. We meet in different locations throughout the week. And if you'd like to join us in person, we'd love to have you visit us. You can find all the details on our website at www.aspirechurch.co.uk. Or if you'd like further information, find us on Facebook, look us up on Twitter. We also live stream all of our services. And once again, if you'd like to view online, you can find all the details on our website. Thank you for joining us today, being part of our ministry. We'd love to help you in any way that we can. God bless you.